is important when you have, but it's really important because we do have such potential for these exotic um, invasive potentially pests to come into the state in Florida. Being in the first detector program then, you will start to learn how to identify some of the potential invasives that are that everybody's kind of on the lookout for right now that we suspect are pretty much on their way, kind of imminent um, introduction into Florida. You can then submit these digital samples and that can aid in the early detection of the invasive pests. So obviously the quicker we know that it's here, the better chance we have of managing it and eradicating it, hopefully. So DDIS is important for a whole lot of reasons, really obvious reasons when we start talking about extension, which you guys are familiar with, but DDIS is like a hub is the best way to look at it for a lot of different groups um, that we all work together, but the quicker we can work together, the quicker we can get out ahead of these potential problems. So DDIS is kind of a centralized location for all this information to be stored and accessed by these multiple different groups then. So you have submitters, sample submitters, like first detectors, like you guys are gonna be, um, and extension clientele get a quick, um, accurate identification. Um, the county agents then, county extension agents, get that information very quickly and can respond. And then you have the regulatory agencies, the lab experts, all of those can use that database to make management decisions and then continue on to more advanced research at the same time, okay? So again, through DDIS, you have the ability to submit plant disease samples or what you think may be disease. Sometimes it's, it's not readily obvious to most folks. Um, insects, plant and weed IDs, um, mushroom and fungi, uh, plant management and those physiology and nutrient problems that can be a little bit elusive sometimes, all kinds of invasive species then, and even for livestock, we do, like I say, have a lot of users here in Pasco County, but you'll see people submit samples like you see here of the chanterelle mushrooms. Um, sometimes it's just out of sheer curiosity what it is. Other times people are quite concerned um, as to what it could be. And um, I saw somebody post a, a earth star uh, mushroom the other day on Facebook and was like, what is this taking over my lawn? And they were terrified of it. So sometimes people, you know, are, are really quite concerned about what they're uh, coming across in their landscapes. So you guys can absolutely become a user of DDIS. And again, like I said, it's, it's an underutilized service. Um, but it is an excellent tracking tool, really, for, for the experts to, to be able to help them. But it's a quick connection. And so basically what the best thing to do would be to reach out to a local extension agent. You guys, that's going to be me. Reach out to us and say, hey, I want to be a user of, of DDIS. And for, for you guys, it would make total sense um, to do that. And then you simply go to the site that you see here. If you Google DDIS and IFAS or, or UF, you're, this site's going to pop up for you. You're going to scroll down to the very bottom of the page that you can see here over to the right-hand side of the screen. In user group, you're going to select extension clientele. And when it asks you for IFAS unit name, you just put NA, okay? And then what's going to happen is once you fill out um, this form, for um, with information that's going to send a notice over to me and I'm going to approve it. Um, and at that time then, once you get notification you've been approved, you can begin to submit samples, which is, is quite easy um, and pretty straightforward. So on this homepage that you would then have access to, you would click on My DDIS. You see there in the red box. And that's how you would begin your sample submission. Pretty quick and straightforward. And actually, it's interesting just to browse um, what others have submitted and kind of see what, what's being turned in and some of the um, answers you get from the experts. Um, it can be, be really interesting stuff, even if it doesn't necessarily pertain to your particular situation. So submitting samples, again, these are digital samples, which makes life so much quicker and easier. To submit a sample at the top of the DDIS, my DDIS page, the first option says my samples. 
my samples. You see it there? So this is where users can look at the samples that they have submitted. They can see the reports that have been generated, any feedback that they've gotten. Um, they'll get notification there that it's been identified, their sample. And then they can start a new sample submission here by clicking on the Submit a Sample for Diagnosis button. You see it there by the little um, yellow arrow and the leaf. Again, it's just a couple of pages here to complete all this. You'll select the sample type for the submission. This is kind of the next step here. Sometimes you're not quite sure. So the, ne the, the best thing about this is you can select multiple boxes if you're not quite sure what you're dealing with. So that's nice. Then you would click Next. You would input as much information as you possibly can here. The more you've got, the better, especially for the tracking purposes that the expert experts and the folks doing the research really, really need. Um, you would put name, address, the location, if you can, GPS coordinates. Again, it's really super easy using a cell phone these days. You know, if you're out in a state park, um, a wildlife area, just out in your yard somewhere, um, you know, you can actually get your coordinates very, very easily and put those in. And that helps us really, really zero in for tracking purposes. Um, and if you take if you take photos on your phone, I think you can actually activate GPS coordinates to stamp onto that photo at the same time. Um, and, and that's really, really handy and very easy. So any information that you can provide in terms of the uh, maybe host plants, if you know a plant and you see something on it, if you have the level of infestation, like if you only see one of these things or thousands of these things. Um, you know, anything about the surrounding environment could be really, really important um, in identification and especially tracking purposes down the road. All right. So then what's going to happen is basically that information is going to get kicked over in the system to the extension agent. And so the extension agents are then going to either um, identify it or it's going to get kicked over to one of the experts um, uh, and specialist for um, further um, identification purposes then, a much more accurate diagnosis. So the last step that you're going to do um, before you submit this sample is you're going to add your images and you can add up to seven images. So this is really nice, really simple, straightforward stuff right there off of your phone. Um, you know, you can do DDoS, I have it bookmarked on your phone. Obviously, you can, you know, transfer this stuff over your desktop and, and use it that way if you want to, but you can do every bit of this right there on your uh, cell phone, which is nice, okay? So you can add, you can remove images if they're not very clear. And again, when you're, you're thinking about images, just like if you're working plant clinic and you're asking somebody to submit a sample, get a close-up, a few close-ups, different angles, get kind of an overall picture of the landscape, overall picture of a tree or plant, you know, the animal, the organism, these kinds of things. So several different angles um, is very important here, okay? So like I said, once your sample is submitted, you then it gets kicked over to the extension agents. If we're not able to identify it, it's gonna get kicked over um, to a specialist and then you're gonna receive an identification of your sample and further information um, that may actually include any kind of management recommendations that are necessary as well, which is really nice, um, quick, quick way. Now, some people might say, well, can I just go straight to the extension agent? Absolutely. But remember one of the benefits here of using the DDoS um, platform is because it really can help with tracking purposes at the same time. All right, so um, when you're talking about plant disease samples here, remember with, and, and you guys are gonna know this, but with plant diseases, um, you know, time is of the essence, number one, um, because you tend to have everything kind of overtake the sample very quickly and it makes it really hard to identify actually what is um, affecting, impacting the plant. And you have a lot of different plant pathogens that can cause very, very similar symptoms. So 
once a submission is made into DDIS through photos, it's very likely if a specialist or an extension agent suspects something that could be quite serious or invasive, something new, they may ask for a sample um, to actually be brought in or sent in um, that can help in identification because sometimes this stuff needs to be grown out in a laboratory for proper identification. So, you know, at that point, you'd be communicating with, with me, the extension agent in the county, um, and maybe even the plant disease clinic at the same time to get a proper identification. All right, so you got some citations here. Um, you know, when it, when it, just keep in mind, um, when it comes to reporting a pest in Florida, again, this, this really is important. Um, you know, we faculty members are, are responsible for reporting diseases, insects, weeds, nematodes, anything invasive. Basically, we make sure that's reported over to FDAX, Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, and then DPI, Division of Plant Industry under FDAX, because those are the folks that are really going to dig into this, start tracking this, try to quarantine it, try to eradicate it. Um, if necessary. So this reporting is really essential um, and, and it's certainly a service that you're doing beyond your particular needs um, at the same time to help our communities, our natural areas, um, and definitely our agriculture, commodities, and um, economy. So local extension agents are there to assist and either be able to answer um, and identify the situation or carry carry that torch on to the, the folks that need the information for tracking and research purposes, okay? So again, and you guys I know are very familiar with FDAX, um, uh, you know, this is where um, FDAX is going to be critical in helping to um, identify and track and, and control any kind of invasives that are coming in, okay? So lots of information here. Um, you guys can always reach out to me. Um, obviously, if you think you found something weird, and I know a lot of you do, you send me stuff sometimes, some weird stuff, so keep it coming, but I obviously really look to utilize DDIS at the same time. It can be instrumental down the road. So if you get any questions or any comments, get those over into the chat, and Shannon, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Whitney. Um, yeah, so does anybody have any questions about DDIS or sample submission? Um, not related to those, Shannon, but I, I did see your question in the chat and I did send a somewhat lengthy reply, but I could summarize it here for you if you're interested. Um, there was a question about whether there are land inspections of trucks coming out of, say, Miami, since Miami is the leading stateside importer with the seaport. And um, really the short answer to that is you know, unfortunately, once a commodity um, passes through CBP, which is Customs and Border Protection, um, and which is part of the Department of Homeland Security, or um, PPQ, which is a, a sect of the USDA, it stands for Plant Protection and Quarantine, those two organizations do inspect commodities coming into the ports. Um, but they are only able to look at a, a small fraction of what comes in. And unfortunately, once those things pass by there and are put on trucks, unless uh, the destination state has its own um, interdiction program, which I know California does, um, and there might be a couple other states that do as well. But once they leave those, those ports, they're generally not looked at again, um, with the exception um, Florida does have outbound on our ag stations that Shannon mentioned earlier. We do have outbound stations associated with those, and they're usually right across the interstate from the inbound station. Um, however, due to personnel limitations, both stations can't be manned at the same time. And so generally, they spend the majority of their time on the inbound side protecting Florida as much as they can. Um, but they do from time to time set up on the outbound side and they will look at things, especially things like citrus that are not really supposed to leave the state without the proper phytosanitary certificates and things like that. So um, we do our best, but yeah, unfortunately, once these things are put on, on trucks, um, they're generally free to leave and go elsewhere in the United States. 
Thanks, Brad. That, that adds a lot of clarification to that question, I think. Um, and before we go into our first um, actual activity, did anybody have any last minute questions about uh, for Whitney? Okay, if not, um, we're going to be hey, Shannon, up. Oh, can yeah. I can I stop you real quick? Yeah. There's an interesting question in here from Mark. Um, do you have a brief example of a reporting that led to a physical response? I know they're curious. They want to know. Um, oh, for like an invasive, um, I'm sh sure there has been. Um, I've only been on this program for a year. Um, Lyle, do you know of any? that came through DDIS? Oh, through DDIS? I can't think of any at the moment. Uh, I do think of that uh, potaspid bug that some that was identified over iNaturalist and one of the DPM uh, students found and alerted the right people. Yeah. Um... I could add a little bit to that. Um, yeah, one of our, another DPM student um, was on iNaturalist and um, found, I think it's the um, black bean bug, um, which is- Yeah, that's to, correct, Shannon. <laughs> which is not supposed to be here. And so it was on a beach in Miami. Um, and I think a, originally a, a teacher had been on the beach and took a picture of these weird bugs on iNaturalist. and. Um, they originally thought it was the kudzu bug, which is an invasive pest. Um, but uh, yeah, it was a brand new species that was just hanging out on the beach eating, I think it was like sea grapes or something on the beach bean. Um, so definitely having like a network of, um, of volunteers looking for and reporting pictures. You just never know when that's gonna, um, something's gonna pop up and that's gonna help out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I just, you know, add to that, Shannon, you know, um, a lot of these um, online, um, what do you call them? Um, forgetting the term right now, but things like iNaturalist and, you know, I've got one.org and, and uh, Bugwood, these different, um, you know, general public user applications um, I, I am a, I'm an, a reviewer on, on one of those applications, the Bugwood one. And um, it, it's, it's definitely eye-opening that there's a lot of people looking for things out there. And we certainly rely on that type of information. Now, it all has to be vetted you know, by, by experts to do the identifications. But um, the majority of our invasive reports um, do come from the general public and not necessarily from you know, our inspections at ports and things like that. And that's why this program, um, this first detector program is so important um, as well as other outreach programs are very important to what we do. Okay, uh, is, any other questions? If not, I'll go ahead. Um, we'll be doing build a bug. Um, so a fun little activity. Um, okay, so Everybody should receive the prompt to join. Okay. Uh, it looks like uh, it's 1030, so it's ready to come back um, from break. And uh, Taylor, you're ahead of, well, ahead of schedule, so thank you. <laughs> um, I get so worried that it's not going to work. I don't know. <laughs> um, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Okay, um, my name's Taylor. I'm a plant pathologist at the Division of Plant Industry here at FDAX. Um, I was asked to talk about palm diseases. So my first um, kind of plan of action was to gather everybody I work with um, and ask them, um, like we came up with as a team, basically what we see the most and what we get called about the most. Um, I kind of tried to put together uh, as many field pictures as I could, but also for those of you who are interested, there are some um, pictures of cultures or spores, um, which is kind of what we look for too. Um, here's an overview, I kind of broke it up into fungal uh, phytoplasmas and abiotic. Um, palms are notoriously difficult 
uh, there's number one overlapping symptoms like crazy between abiotic problems, insect damage, phytoplasms, cold, you know, um, and fungal diseases. And then secondly, they're really difficult just because of the way they grow. Like a lot of times they're, the canopy is 20 feet in the air. So some of the most distinguishable characteristics um, are basically missed uh, due to that fact. So we broke it up into, like I said, these, these three um, different sections and I'm just gonna kind of go through them and, um, and then I'll answer any questions you have. So the first one we see a lot is Fusarium wilt. There's actually two subspecies of Fusarium, um, Fusarium oxysporum palmarum and um, canariensis, which are pretty different genetically or different enough genetically, but also differentiated based on host. So you're gonna see uh, one on queen palm and Mexican palm, whereas the other one is primarily uh, Canary Island date palm. The symptoms you're going to see first are going to be on the lowest leaves and then they'll, as the disease progresses, the, um, the, the fronds, the disease of the fronds will also move up. Um, really characteristic of this one is if you're able to get uh, a rachis down, one side will be brown, uh, which you see in picture three. Um, and then <clears throat> the reddish brown line like all the way down that rachis is like the almost a line of demarcation. And then um, picture four is a pretty typical fusarium colony. It's a real like kind of light pink color and like basically blanket statement with most um, with basically all problems with palm is it's going to require a, a lab diagnostics to come to full understanding about what's happening with the palm. So four is just kind of a depiction of the second step out of four of what we determine in the lab, which, which ultimately which will ultimately lead to a diagnosis down the road. Um, the second one that I'm talking about is Ganoder uh, Ganoderma butt rot of palms. This one is really unique because it's a basidiomycete, which is unique. Uh, most fungal pathogens are not in that group. This one is really tricky because you won't see this like number three, picture number three is the uh, basidiocarp, which only comes out of a palm after a pretty long gestation of the disease. And at that point, the palm is, it's done basically. And actually at DPI, we've come up with a, a molecular test kind of recently in the last couple of years where we can drill into the palm and find uh, traces of this disease before the basidiocarp comes out. Basically that helps us tell the homeowner or nurseryman um, to pull the palm then because as soon as that basidiocarp emerges from the palm, it's gonna spread like wildfire to the surrounding palms. And all palms are essentially a host of this lethal disease. Um, again, the lower leaves being uh, the first affected, um, you're going to see that in, in almost all palm diseases. Um, before I go on to the, the butt rots, that's kind of important to consider the actual anatomy of palms. Um, they're really unique in that they have a um, <clears throat> They have a bud or heart of the palm tree, and that's the apical meristem. All leaves originate from that growing point. Um, the height of the growing point relative to soil depends on the height of the palm tree. Um, at the top of the tree where the arrow points, um, that's the spear leaf, and that's the youngest unopened leaf. So it's important to talk about it because if that growing point is damaged, um, becomes diseased or is damaged, the palm will die. And that brings me into the trunk rots, which affect essentially that tissue, the apical meristem. Uh, Flaviopsis we see um, pretty frequently. It'll be mainly I get call, we get calls when we when um, photo number two when something like that happens or like my palm tree literally bent in half, um, and we're like, oh well, that's probably a butt rot, and then we'll get diseased tissue and 
sure enough, we'll find um, spores like in picture number four, which is characteristic of Flaviopsis. So <clears throat> the, the pathogen resides in the trunk and it basically just eats away at all that, um, that tissue. Sometimes we'll see stem bleeding, but it's only in coconut palm. Um, so we get a lot of calls about stem bleeding, but typically the literature states that it's only um, coconut palm for this disease that does that. Um, then with this one, the upper third of the trunk is most of the time the one that the, the pathogen resides in that tissue, um, mainly because it, um, that tissue is like a little bit softer than the bottom trunk tissue. And then we take, we ask um, people take samples from like anything that looks um, like decayed tissue, like the margin of decayed tissue um, to try to get this pathogen out. Uh, the next one is Phytophthora bud rot of palm. Um, all palms again are considered hosts. Uh, discoloration and wilting of the spear leaf is the first symptom typically. And you see that number one. But again, it's super hard, uh, it's super easy to miss in a, in a palm tree that's very tall, whereas a number three, picture number three shows like a shorter palm and you can see the spear leaf um, is clearly dead in that picture. Um, eventually the oldest leaves will begin to exhibit the symptoms and become yellow and um, wilted and that gets confused with like normal senescence of the leaves. Um, I know, I'm sure you're familiar with a palm's normal growth rate is the bottom leaves naturally senesce. Those are the ones that people usually take off for a hurricane trim, uh, trim job. Um, then again, the lab diagnostics is, um, is needed. Um, and then um, picture four is kind of to show you the sporangia of the phytophthora. And then the leaf spots are very uh, pretty overlapping symptoms, except for graphiola, uh, the distinct, it has more of a distinct, like the thread structure that comes out. Um, but this, could, could, this often gets confused with sometimes herbicides, sometimes insect damage, and sometimes cold damage um, has an overlapping symptom of this as well. We mostly see it on Phoenix, but it is observed on other palms. Um, I haven't seen this one very often, but uh, a lab mate of mine sees it a lot. Um, I lumped these together because they, on, depending on the host and the amount of time the palm has been infected, um, the symptoms can, um, can vary basically. So we see a lot of bipolaris, uh, cylindricladium, exerhylum, and uh, pestilosia. Um, they, uh, the initial spots can be super small, like a little pen prick, and then they get bigger and bigger, or some begin as like a water-soaked lesion. Uh, let's see. And then the big ticket item is Texas. This brings us into the uh, phytoplasm. So it's Texas Phoenix palm decline and lethal yellowing. I lumped them into one slide because the field symptoms are identical. Um, there's overlap between the two phytoplasms. They're pretty closely related, um, like molecularly. Uh, the early symptoms of this are the death of the lower canopy leaves, which I've mentioned with like almost every disease. But this one is special because it will have death of the inflorescence, which you can see in number three. That's unique to the phytoplasm. Um, the final symptom is death of the spear leaf. And then um, it's vectored by an insect, a plant hopper. And um, often it's confused with um, most, most often Ganoderma butt rot and um, really most often Fusarium wilt. And um, we have a molecular test that we drill. Um, we send our inspectors out with like a TPPD kit, we call it. It's like a bottle of alcohol, a, a torch flame, and a drill with a pretty big drill head on it, and um, and collection baggies. And they literally just like spray alcohol on the drill, flame the drill to sterilize it, and drill into the palm and collect the shavings that come out uh, while they're drilling into the palm. And we um, extract the DNA from that sample and run it for. Um, we run it in a molecular analysis that will come up e either TPPD or lethal yellowing. But by and large, Texas uh, Phoenix palm decline is um, way more common. I don't think in the last 
three or four years, we've had an actual lethal yellowing. Um, it's a bit of an older disease. It was more prevalent when we had a ton of coconut, um, coconut palms, which um, is the reason basically why we don't have many anymore. Um, coal damage is one of those things that I, we get a ton of calls in, but it's really hard because palms grow in general, very, very slow. So even a cold event that happened even more than a year ago um, will have symptoms, sometimes just very delayed symptoms. And palms, palms are generally like that with like hurricanes. Um, we get a lot of calls right now in, um, in coastal areas that were in the path of a, of a hurricane. And they're like, but it's just now dying. And <laughs> like, it's just taken that long because they grow that slowly. Um, so with cold damage, like everything else, each palm species is affected differently and by very different temperatures. Some are way, way more cold hardy than others. Um, the apical meristem itself can suffer um, cold damage and this can result in like a, a bacteria getting in there and like causing some rot. And that often gets confused with Phytophthora, which I um, talked about earlier with the spear leaf dying. And you can actually go in there and uh, this has happened to a palm tree I had in a pot outside or like, like kind of like tugged on the spear leaf and it'll just pull right out. And that's typically um, from cold damage experienced. Um, the reddish blotching pattern, which looks like a disease, that's pretty common. And then um, this, the picture three, the stem cracking, um, that's like something you see way down the line, like I was talking about with the length of time, like it means that something, basically the cold damaged the palm, but it just took that long to come out. And so that's something, picture three is probably something that it got damaged by cold like several seasons prior to that picture being taken, which makes diagnostics super fun. Um, then there's some nutrient deficiencies. Um, palms, again, because they grow so slowly, and they're just a different way of growing. The deficiencies, um, like when you see the deficiency, it pretty much means that it was a while ago that it started having problems. And then when you try to amend it, you have to expect that it's gonna take a while for it to actually show um, the basically the fruits of your labor of, of adding nutrients to it. I get a lot of calls and are like, I fertilized, you know, I fertil I keep fertilizing. I'm like, well, be careful. Don't add too much because it's good. Just add and keep it watered and happy. And then in probably several months, it'll show the symptoms um, to start to um, abate. Um, so with manganese deficiency, it's really common, especially in soils with a high pH because the nutrient itself gets, um, becomes not available to the palm. Um, people usually call this like frizzle top. Uh, you can see it in the bottom right hand picture, kind of not a very good picture on the left here. Um, but basically the leaves just like look kind of frizzly. And this one gets confused with cold damage too. Let's see, boron deficiency. Um, I've seen the number one, the bent leaves and number three, I've had calls about that. And somebody actually knew about the labiopsis and asked me if it was that. And we told them um, it was most likely a boron deficiency because it still had the canopy. And then number two, uh, the, the leaves can actually just start growing straight down. And um, this one, you're gonna see it on the newly emerging leaves. And then it, then it will continue down like, you know, cause the palm, grows up like a spear leaf and then folds down. And so those new leaves that come up will have it and then they become the leaves like on the bottom, basically, that's hard to explain. And um, they will continue to have that symptom until, so it will be the new growth. Like once it's boron has been applied, it'll be like the new growth later on that will show normal symptoms, but then the older growth will still show that boron deficiency. It's, re they're, um, it's really common to see like uh, palmate palms like will be basically variegated. Um, I should have put a picture of that, but I didn't. Let's see what else. Potassium deficiency gets confused a lot with leaf spot. Um, you can see that in 
um, and four and one. Sometimes it, get con it gets confused with cold injury because the cold injury can cause that uh, speckling as well. But uh, most of the time, if you're gonna see it um, in that kind of like the leaf curling and necrosis, that's, that's most of the time when I see it. And we don't do leaf tissue analysis. So when we culture these things, because it's confusing for us, even in the lab, particularly when it's been taken in from the field and we don't really know all of this, the whole story, uh, we'll culture and we'll get nothing out of it. And we'll just have to almost speculate that what nutrient it is um, <clears throat> based on the host and the symptoms. And uh, because we don't actually have to do the leaf tissue analysis here. Um, so again, palm diseases are, they're hard to diagnose um, in the field. And then even when we receive the sample in the lab, it can be hard. And like I said, the injury events can take months to years um, to cause symptoms. So that most important takeaway with that is uh, nutrient deficiencies can be really slow to remedy. So people have a tendency to be pretty heavy handed with fertilizer too early. Um, so they'll apply it before the basically the, the healthy tissue starts growing again, and then that causes more, more issues. And so that's what all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions to the best of my ability. Thank you, Taylor. Um, uh, did anybody have any questions for Taylor? Um, just one is, and again, I'm a newbie, so I'm going to ask stupid questions. Um, is a pinch trunk on a palm basically an uh-uh moment that you know something's going on as opposed to the straight up or swelled trunk? A pinch trunk, do you mean like that it constricts in one area and then grows normally above it? That, but most, most importantly, uh, at the crown. Okay. where it is narrowed, definitely narrowed as, a, as opposed to the balance of the trunk? That is actually, okay, that's a good question. Hang on. That is, um, I know boron deficiency does that. And boron deficiency is pretty common. Let me see if I can go back to that picture, actually. You can kind of, I'm going to see if this is what you're talking about. Because I know over trimming can do that, but yeah. outside, of, outside yeah. of the obvious. Are you talking about pencil pointing, Julie? Yes. 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 Pencil pointing typically would be caused by over pruning and the loss of the carbohydrate storage. Okay. Yeah. See number yeah, three. I tell there. people that call in um, not to do that. <laughs> I don't know if I'm allowed to actually tell people what to do about their homes, but I tell them not to trim them. So number three in that picture you just pulled up, that isn't an that wouldn't be uh, right there. That wouldn't be telling me when I start to see that trunk narrowing, that would not be telling me that there's something else going on besides trimming? Boron deficiency can do that. Okay, all right. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. We also had a um, question from Julie who said, while the palm has a more shallow root system than an oak, for example, are these diseases I think she sent this when we were talking about the fungal diseases, um, okay. vectored above ground or do palms talk to each other like a dicot, like oak trees, i.e. underground transfer slash migration of the disease? Okay, that's a really good question because in particular, um, the fungal um, fusarium, and I probably, I should have mentioned that, I'm sorry. I have a nine month old at home that doesn't sleep. So I still have that uh, sleep deprived brain going on. Fusarium in particular is something like, although you think of an oak tree as having these, um, to some extent, much um, intertangled root systems, palms, um, as you guys probably know, basically go straight down, but the soil itself can become infested, um, especially with fungal uh, pathogens, um, which um, are able to basically force their life cycle into like storage um, and long-term kind of um, structures that can live in the soil. So Fusarium and um, the Ganoderma butt rot, one, this one, 
Um, the soil can become infested with these spores. So if a tree dies in a location and you take it out and then you plant another palm, um, even if it's not the same species, even if it's just in the palm, palm family, uh, it can become very quickly infected uh, because it, it was placed in infested soil. You don't see that with phytoplasms because they have a, an insect vector, but particularly with Fusarium and Ganoderma, I would say those are the two, two probably biggest. Uh -huh. You so you would have to treat the soil with an antifungal mixture before you replanted it at that area, assuming you'd have the guts to do that. And plus, what you're suggesting is that they don't communicate under that disease underground, but the ground that originally hosted that infected plant is damaged. It's infested, yes. So, and so say, say you were really, um, really bent on putting a palm back um, in that location, I would say that there is no amount of um, fungicide that's going to get all the structures just because of the nature of the soil. Um, I, the, the first thing that comes to mind is like uh, ne like nematode treatment in um, commercial agriculture, how they basically fumigate to get like it would be it would have to be that level. I don't know of any um, like homeowner situation where they'd be willing to go that far. Yeah, you're, you're quite right, because we do that. Uh, we would treat the soil with a fungicide after infection when we're dealing with um, olive trees uh, okay. to try and replant in the same. I think Dr. Elmore knows about that more than I do. But yeah, OK, so you're basically it would not be wise to replant the same mistake in the same area. Got it. Not in a res so you're talking about, yeah, in commercial agriculture they can run a cost benefit analysis on a situation like that. And it would make sense for them to have like kind of remediation measures like that. But in a homeowner situation, like other than the fact that palms, which we're seeing a lot now fit in places that a lot of other plant species do not fit. Um, other than that, there's really no reason to like fight that battle. I mean, I, if they were really bent, if, if, so, if a homeowner called me and they were really bent on replanting a palm there, I would say, um, <clears throat> to give it time, like a good amount of time, like a couple of winters, <laughs> you know. And it okay. doesn't preclude the fact that we can plant another species, not palm, but even an oak there. I mean, what infected the palm wouldn't necessarily translate into another species altogether. Right. Yeah, right. But some people, um, I think particularly because there's some economy involved in it, like some of these really illustrious phoenix palms can be very expensive and they're very slow to grow. And I get calls from, particularly from South Florida. Uh, I had it, one lady got like, was so upset because she uh, cannot remember the species of palm now off the top of my head, but she had her whole exterior of her house was designed around the lands, you know, the landscaping was a very integral part of the design of the home and it had these big palm trees and she got a basidio carp come out, um, which of course is the Ganoderma butt rot. And she's like, so I had that one die and we took it out. And then the one in my backyard now is dying. And I, and I was like, well, you need probably we sent an inspector out there to test them all because I was like at that point you need to pull them out before that basidio cart comes out because that's like when it just goes proliferation crazy but she she was like my whole house was built around these palms like basically around the look of these palms I'm like um if there are any other questions for Taylor um you can put them in the chat and she could answer mm -hmm. them there um but in the meantime I'll hand it over to Lyle, who will be talking about palm weevil. So another issue with that palms could deal with. <laughs> All right, great. Uh, so I'm Lyle Buss. I run the insect identification lab at the University of Florida Entomology and Nematology Department. And I want to talk to you today about some uh, palm weevils that are major pests of palms. So to begin with, what is a weevil? So these are... Uh, a group of beetles and the superfamily Curculionoidea, which includes the, the true weevils and several other families that are uh, very closely related. 
Uh, you can recognize weevils typically by this uh, elongate rostrum or this uh, snout coming off the, the front of their head with chewing kinds of mandibles at, at the tip of the rostrum. Uh, you can also recognize weevils uh, by their uh, antennae or another good character for identifying them is this elbowed antennae kind of similar to what you would see in ants where that first segment is long and straight and then the other segments of the antennae come off at uh, usually a right angle. Um, there are a lot of species of, of weevils, some 97,000 species in the world, and many of them are major pests to various agricultural crops, uh, various fruit and vegetable plants. There's uh, even some that are pests of stored grains like wheat and corn. So the adult weevils uh, typically would feed on leaf material like this, make notches in the edges of the leaves. But with uh, weevils, like with uh, a lot of beetles and moths, it's actually the immature stage, the, the larvae, that is the, the main cause of the plant damage that you're going to see. Now the weevil grubs are this legless uh, larva that's usually cream colored and pretty soft bodied and uh, they're usually going to be found in hidden locations so you're not as likely to see the larvae as you are to see the adults. So the larvae may be living in the soil feeding on roots like Diaprepi's weevil or they may be boring inside of pepper uh, fruit like the pepper weevil. But the ones that I want to focus on today are the palm weevils belonging to the genus Rhynchophorus, of which there are about 10 species in the world that uh, are pa mostly palm pests. Uh, I'm going to focus on three of them today. Uh, we have a native species, the palmetto weevil, and then two invasive species that we do not have in the US yet, thankfully, the red palm weevil and the South American palm weevil. So to begin with, the palmetto weevil, Rhynchophorus cruentatus, is a native species. And uh, these palm weevils are huge. I mean, th this is the largest weevil species in North America. And so it is a good solid one inch long. So it's huge. They have a kind of a variable color pattern. So I often see the, the pure jet black ones, but they can have various amounts of red or orange mixed in with the black. Being a native species in, in Florida, they are uh, pretty closely associated with uh, the native sable palm or cabbage palm which is one of their, their primary hosts. Uh, palmetto weevil can also get into saw palmetto and a couple other native palms in Florida. Uh, it's it's a, often more of a secondary pest in that they tend to be attracted to palms that have some other issues going on in them. There's uh, already some kind of stress or wounding or injury on, on the plants that is attracting these weevils to them. So you typically don't see a whole lot of palmetto weevil in uh, natural areas where cabbage palms are growing wild. It's more of an issue in, in urban areas where uh, palms are transplanted or where they have other opportunity to get injured. Now, uh, there are some exceptions. Uh, the palmetto weevil has been seen to be damaging seemingly healthy Canary Island date palms. Uh, so that can be an is issue in, in nurseries or uh, date palms that are recently transplanted out into the landscape. So in the life cycle of the, the palmetto weevil, uh, there's usually some kind of injury going on. So it, it may just be that the tree is stressed like with, with drought or there may be possibly pruning or they, they've been transplanted so they have root damage. 
or some other kind of a wound on the plant will release some kind of volatiles in the air that these weevils sense and, and it draws them in. in. Then the, the female will lay her eggs on the, at the base of the palm leaves or on the trunk, maybe at a, at a wound. And after the eggs hatch, the larvae will start to tunnel into the tissue of the palm. Now they uh, like to go for that area around the bud, like Taylor was saying, that apical meristem area is a very important part of the palm. And once that area gets damaged, the, your tree's toast essentially, because that's where all the growth is gonna come from. So once that, uh, that bud is, is damaged, you know, really no way for the, the tree to grow after that. Now, the, given that the adult weevil is about an inch long, the grubs are even, even bigger. And uh, you can imagine uh, an inch or two inch long grub feeding in a palm trunk can do a pretty good amount of damage. And it's usually not just one weevil in there, it could easily be dozens of larvae in, in a single palm tree. So they can do a lot of damage uh, at the base of the leaves. You know, uh, one symptom that you may see is uh, these drooping leaves that are uh, kind of sinking because of the damage at the base. Or you may see this pop neck kind of condition where just all the damage of the weevils tunneling in the stem of the palm <clears throat> makes the uh, top to collapse just from its own weight or in a windstorm. And, you know, so this means that the, uh, the damage that is caused by palmetto weevil and you know, a lot of this damage is also caused by the other exotic species that I'm going to talk about. You know, this is uh, damage that isn't readily evident when, you, when you're out looking at a palm tree. And if you look Closely at the palm, you may see some holes where frass is being pushed out where the larvae are feeding, but most of the time there isn't going to be much for external signs of uh, infestation of these uh, of the weevils. So by the time you see leaves drooping or this pop neck, it's already too late for the palm. They've already done enough damage in that bud area that there's no saving the tree. And about all you can do at that point is remove the tree and destroy it in order to pre prevent weevils from emerging from it and infecting other trees in the area. So the palm, palmetto weevil is a native species. So found from South Carolina over to Texas. They're distributed all throughout Florida. Uh, being a holometabolous insect, they have all four life stages going from egg to larvae to pupa to adult. Uh, when, the, when these legless grubs are done feeding, they will construct a cocoon using fibers in the palm material that they're, that they're feeding on. And uh, then they will turn into the pupal stage inside that cocoon. And maybe three, four weeks later, the adult will emerge and start the cycle over again. So it's, it's pretty tough to manage palm, palm weevils. You know, there are some traps that can be used for monitoring uh, population. These, these bucket traps use uh, plant palm tissue, you know, again, using those volatiles that attract the adults in for laying eggs. Uh, it can be used to monitor populations of the adult weevils in the area. But really the key to managing a lot of these uh, palm weevil pests is prevention. Uh, keeping the palms as healthy as possible, uh, avoiding wounds, pruning, avoid pruning if possible. Um, keeping the, the palms watered when it's really dry out, you know, those kind of things will help uh, not make the palms attractive to the palmetto weevils. And again, once once the weevils are in the tree, you know, it's usually too late and not much can be done to save it. Um, now one of the exotic species that we do not have here and 
One that we are definitely on the lookout for to keep out of Florida is the red palm weevil, Rhinchophorus ferruginius. And this uh, species is native to the southeast part of Asia and some of the Pacific Islands in the area. And it is considered one of the, the probably the most damaging pests of palms in the world. And given the importance of the palm industry in the US and you know, especially Florida, and you go into South Florida, the iconic palm is a uh, you know, big symbol of uh, tropical Florida. So it's something that we can't really do without down there. The red palm weevil uh, is also kind of a variable species in terms of coloration from you know, almost all black to having various amounts of red or orange mixed in. Uh, they can feed on uh, a variety of, of palm hosts. Uh, a couple of their preferred hosts are the African oil palm and the Canary Island date palms. They can also go after many other species that are commonly used in Florida. And again, their damage is gonna be similar to what we would see with the palmetto weevil. But you know, with these exotic species, we still wanna be on the lookout for them because uh, there's always a, a good possibility that uh, these species could be way worse than our native palmetto weevil or could have uh, you know, additional damage on, on species that the palmetto weevil doesn't attack. And so they're still, species that we definitely want to keep out of Florida. So the uh, red palm weevil, you know, as I said, it's uh, native to Southeast Asia, but it already has invaded many other parts of the world. So it's gotten into many countries in the Middle East, in uh, Northern Africa, uh, Europe. It's uh, gotten a little bit into the Caribbean and couple islands that are very close to the north side of South America. Uh, so far, it has not made its way into the U.S. So many states are on the lookout for it, but uh, thankfully it hasn't been found here yet. Again, similar life cycle to our native palmetto weevil. Uh, again, uh, it's difficult to, to control it. Uh, without uh, you know, just having to sacrifice the palm and, and burn it to kill all the weevils. Uh, the third species I want to talk about is the South American palm weevil, Rhinchophorus palmarum. And uh, this one is a, a little closer to home. It is uh, native to Central and South America and also Mexico and uh, uh, causes a lot of the same kind of damage feeding in the trunk of the palm as the, the previous two species. But in addition, this uh, species is a vector of the red ring nematode, which can cause a disease called red ring disease. And this is a, a lethal disease uh, when it gets into coconut palms. Again, this uh, South American palm weevil can infect a variety of palm trees, especially the coconut palm and African oil palm are a couple of the uh, preferred hosts. Again, it's uh, damage. A lot of it is uh, pretty similar to the other ones, but uh, you can see here in the lower left, uh, when you have the red ring disease, uh, killing the coconut palm. This this is what you would see when you uh, cut the the tree down. This uh, this distinct red ring uh, in the cut end of the palm trunk. So this this species uh, being uh, found in Mexico, you know, it's not too far away from uh, Florida. Or, well, 
it, it also has gotten into uh, areas of the Caribbean. So it is found in many of the Caribbean islands, including Cuba and Puerto Rico. And so that makes it uh, already pretty close to Florida. Uh, it has been detected in a few states, uh, namely California, Arizona, and Texas, because they are bordering Mexico. Now, when it comes to uh, you know, potential pathways for these palm weevils to, to get into the U.S. Uh, of course, uh, you know, the first obvious one is the beetles can fly. And so when you have a species like the South American palm weevil uh, found in uh, Mexico, it may be possible for an adult weevil to just fly over the border into, into the U.S. because bugs just don't respect borders very well. And uh, that may be the case uh, of what has happened in uh, some of these southern states, but uh, luckily it has not become established in any of these states in the U.S. so far. Now, the, the primary pathway that we think of for the spread of these invasive palm weevils is the movement of live palm trees. And, uh, you know, a large palm tree is, is pretty valuable, many thousands of dollars. And, uh, so, and in infested palm being brought over state lines can uh, start the infest, uh, new infestation pretty easily. And I believe in Florida, the, there are some pretty strict regulations as far as the movement of palm trees. And I don't think uh, it is something that can really be done anymore without some permits. Uh, Besides the uh, movement of the, the palm trees themselves, there are some palm products that the movement of could be a way to spread some of these weevils. So I think of uh, that there is a market for some coconut fibers uh, that can be used for maybe packing material or, or other uses. And, uh, you know, I guess it's always possible that uh, weevil could have uh, pupated in those kind of fibers and you could have a cocoon in there that would be hard to detect. And so that's another potential pathway. Uh, fourth pathway is uh, intentional movement. And, uh, you know, these big grubs found in the palm trees in some parts of the world, these are actually eat. Uh, people will eat these. Sometimes it's a, a delicacy. And so it's conceivable that someone may intentionally move, uh, bring in some of these weevils just for the uh, purpose of uh, being able to eat the grubs that they raise. Uh, again, life cycle is similar uh, as is the, the management. Uh, so I wanna do a brief uh, description of uh, how to identify uh, these. And I talked a bit about color, but color is a variable thing in at least a, a couple of these species. So you don't want to rely solely on the color patterns to identify them. Uh, another good character is uh, the shape of the pronotum, which is this plate behind the head, covers the, the thorax. And you can see in the, the native palmetto weevil, uh, they kind of had that broad shoulders kind of look and you know, the pronotum is a bit more squarish in appearance as opposed to the two invasive species where you know, that edge is much more tapered. And when you look at the, uh, the posterior border here of the pronotum, it's a uh, more of a flat or straight kind of edge. Whereas in the invasive species, uh, it's more of a rounded, uh, tail end to the pronotum, more visible here. Uh, another character that uh, entomologists would look for to identify these species is the scutellum, which is this uh, little plate that is right between the two elytra, the, the wing covers here. And there's this little uh, triangular shaped plate here. And uh, the shape of this scutellum is another identifying character. So in these characters that uh, entomologists would use, but it might be hard for you to, to really be able to distinguish these species unless you have some either good pictures or specimens to compare to. Uh, 
another character on the uh, adult males is uh, whether there are CD on the top of the snout. It's uh, not, not found in the uh, palmetto weevil that's native, but in the invasive species, they do have these CD. Uh, also some characters on the underside of the head. So, uh, you know, when it, when it comes to finding specimens and deciding whether they're worth sending in, you know, you can kind of do a preliminary identification from here to see if it might be worth sending it in. You know, it, almost surely the specimens that you find in Florida are going to be the native palmetto weevil, but if there's some circumstances that you're seeing where maybe a palm was getting damaged uh, uh, be, and being damaged uh, in a way that you wouldn't expect from the, nor the na normal native species. Maybe it's a species of palm that our palmetto weevil doesn't typically attack, then that, that's a good reason there to send specimens in to have them checked out. And I'll stop with that and turn it back over to you, Shannon. Thank you, Lyle. Um, uh, does anybody have any questions for Lyle? I did get a, a question in the chat. I'm wondering, uh, hi, this is Lynn. I'm wondering if we could get copies of these uh, little, of these slides. These are really helpful. Yeah, we, the, definitely with the, the palm uh, weevil. It will be on our website um, that this presentation is actually available. And we, um, I can send you a link to that or a copy of the, the PDF as well. Either one, that's great, thank you. Um, the question in the chat is from Julie and it's about preventative measures. She asked, can any prophylactic measures be taken, painting the trunk from soil line up a bit, covering, et cetera? Ah, there are, there are some things that can be done with uh, insecticides. So um, I think it is possible to apply an insecticide in the, especially the bud area where the weevil, weevils are gonna be laying their eggs in order to either prevent the females from laying eggs or uh, killing the, the tiny larvae as they're hatching and starting to tunnel into the palm tissue. But it's uh, kind of hard to do. Timing it is difficult and keeping a level of insecticide present to constantly stop the attacks is very hard to do. And I guess it depends on what kind of uh, uh, residual effect that particular insecticide has. But uh, for high value trees, it might be a way to go. Uh, otherwise, we figure trying to minimize any kind of damage to the tree is, is the best thing to do. Thank you, Lyle. Um, I we're going to be sending everybody into the breakout groups again um, for group leaders. Uh, we're going to call everybody back at 1128. Ooh, that was our lightning round breakout session, Shannon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. <laughs> we, we did get through it all, though, and had time for, for a question. So. Oh, awesome, awesome. Um, yeah, and... Um, so sometimes you just have to do that with how the, the workshop falls. I know mm -hmm. people don't want to be stuck at the, their computer um, longer than they have to. You probably want to be out in your, your backyard right now with how pretty it is. Um, but before um, we say, um, before we end things, I did, I just put in the chat the um, attendance survey and an exit survey. And the attendance survey is really important because um, as Whitney was saying earlier, you guys are, you know, Florida first detectors now, and we'll be sending her um, some, uh, some goodie bags. So they'll have a tote bag, you'll get your own um, hand lens, some sampling um, vials, and then you also get like a little cardboard shipment um, so that if you have a sample, you can ship it to, to Lyle to identify. And she'll be giving out, um, well, she'll have on hand um, coupons where if you're interested in submitting a, um, a, a sample to either uh, the Insect ID Lab or the Plant Diagnostic Center for if it looks like a disease, um, 
we'll have, which is a $40 value, we'll be able to hand those out. And so I also emailed everybody the links to the, um, the surveys. And if you guys could fill that out, I'll stay on the line for any um, other um, issues or questions. And um, I'll put them up in the chat again. I emailed them to you through Eventbrite. So uh, just thank you guys so much for joining me. Um, I'm really, and us, I was really excited to put on the workshop today for Pasco County. And um, Whitney, I didn't know if you had any final remarks that you wanted to make. Just want to thank you and your team that you've put together for the presentations and the PowerPoints and what you guys do. And thanks to the MGs for being here and uh, becoming first detectors. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. And I hope you have a great um, rest of your week. And um, yeah, just hope you all have a good day.